do you all ever have trouble remembering things? Do you ever have trouble with forgetfulness? Do you ever forget where you lost your cell phone, your wallet, your checkbook, your mind? Well, we have a trouble with forgetting, don't we? Uh, I read about two elderly ladies that were talking about the challenges of growing older. And, and one said to the other, you know, the hardest thing for me about growing older is my memory. For, for example, I've known you my whole life, but I just cannot remember your name. What is it? The second lady thought for a moment and said, how quickly do you need an answer? We, we are a forgetful people, aren't we? Some of you will remember back in the 70s, the Kodak Corporation, the, the camera corporation, had an ad that used a line from a Paul Anka song. The, the line was, do you remember the times of your life? And the whole ad campaign was built on the fact that we're a forgetful people. And so Kodak said, buy a Kodak camera, take a Kodak picture, make a Kodak moment. That will help you to remember. Last weekend was Memorial Day, a day in which our nation pauses to remember uh, to remember those who have given their lives in service of our nation. We as a nation pause and remember those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice, and, it, and it's good and fitting that we do so. Do you realize even the privilege that we have here today of, of worshiping openly? Pastor Womack mentioned believers all over the world. I, I've had the privilege of being with persecuted believers in Iran, in China, uh, in Nepal, uh, in Romania, all, all over the world. And, and there are brothers and sisters in Christ today who are meeting in secret because if they were discovered, they would be persecuted, perhaps tortured, perhaps jailed. And, and the very freedom that we have to meet openly here in Fort Worth, Texas, is, is a freedom that was bought through the blood of patriots. So, you know, it's, it's appropriate for us to pause and give thanks on days like Memorial Day. It's good for us to remember. Do you know that Christians are called to remember certain things as well? For example, Psalm 105, verse 5, remember his wonders which he has done. But tragically, there's a two-word phrase that we find throughout the scriptures that describes the people of God. You know what that two-word phrase is? They forgot you find it hundreds of times in the scriptures. They forgot. For example, Psalm chapter 78, verse 11. They forgot his deeds and his miracles that he had shown them. We're really good at forgetting. Well, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, the apostle Paul exhorted Timothy to remember five things. I want us to look at this passage today, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, and then unpack these five things that Paul called Timothy to remember, and God through him is calling us to remember today. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, and descended from David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer to the point of being bound like a criminal. But the word of God is not down. God calls us to remember first the person of Christ. The, the opening phrase in this passage is remember Jesus Christ. The, the word remember there is in the imperative. It, it's not a suggestion, it's a command. And, and it's in the present tense, it's active. It doesn't mean remember one time, but constantly, moment by moment, remember Jesus Christ. Ne never let him slip off of your radar. Keep him in focus. Notice how Paul refers to him. Jesus Christ. Jesus emphasizing his humanity. Christ emphasizing, emphasizing his deity. And the additional phrases highlight this emphasis as well. Risen from the dead speaks of his deity. His death was a death for sinners. God gloriously raised him. Descended from David speaks of his humanity. He was actually born into this world. Almighty God stepped into human history in the person of Jesus Christ. We're called to remember Jesus as the Son of God and the Son of Man. 
one who was fully God and yet fully human. Be, because he was fully God, he was perfect, he was holy, he was without sin. Because he was fully man, he can stand in our place as our representative. Because he is both God and man, he's the perfect mediator between a holy God and sinful humanity. Jesus Christ was able to pay for our sins because he had none of his own to pay for. In fact, on one occasion in John chapter 8, verse 46, Jesus stood in front of his most ardent enemies, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, and he asked them a question. He said, who among you convicts me of sin? And the Bible says they were silent. Now, I don't suggest you try that at home. If I were at my church in Louisville, Kentucky today, and, and I stood in front of my congregation and I asked them that question, who among you convicts me of sin? Pretty much every hand in the sanctuary would go up, including my wife's hand. My wife sits right over here, second row. Her hand would go up. If my wife were called to a witness stand and, and the judge reminded her, now, Mrs. Booker, you're under oath. You have promised to tell the truth. Your husband is claimed to be perfect. Is your husband perfect? I think I know how my wife would respond. I think she'd glance over at me and give me a reassuring smile, communicating, sweetheart, I love you, but I do have to tell the truth. She would look back to the judge and say, Judge, I, I love my husband. He's a good man. He's a good husband. He's a good father. He's, he's a great grandfather to our nine grandchildren, but perfect are you kidding me? I've never used the word perfect in the same sentence as my husband. If you were to ask my five children, is your dad perfect? Oh, you'd get an answer. But you'd have to wait roughly 10 to 15 minutes while they rolled on the floor in convulsive laughter at even being asked that question. Now, those are the people who love me. If you were to have been able to ask my seventh grade teacher, Mrs. Creech, is Tim Booker perfect? Oh, you would have gotten an earful. Pastor Womack, I didn't share this story in the first service. It's still scarring for me, but let me explain to you how much Mrs. Creech disliked me. One day, as I walked into the seventh grade classroom, she motioned for me to come forward. So I went up to her desk, and she said to me, Tim, I want you to know I prayed for you this morning. Now, her voice was dripping with sarcasm. I, I knew that. But what do you say when someone says they prayed for you? I said, well, well, thank you, Mrs. Creech. That was very kind. She said, well, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Don't you want to know what I prayed for? I said, sure. And so she motioned for me to bend down more close. And then she whispered into my ear, I prayed for God to snap your neck like a twig. <laughs> I went home and told my mom, and my mom said, well, you must have done something really bad. I said, Mom, no child could do anything that bad. That, that's how much Mrs. Creech disliked me. I'm glad God didn't answer that prayer. Jesus stood in front of his most ardent enemies and asked them a question. Who among you convicts me of sin? And the Bible says they were silent. Their silence spoke volumes. Jesus Christ is the only perfect person who has ever walked on this earth. Because he was holy, his life was an acceptable sacrifice. Because he was human, he was one of us, he stands as our true representative. We sing the chorus, and it's true. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. But now I sing a brand new song, amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. We are called to remember Jesus Christ. Never lose sight of him. Second, we're called to remember the power of the resurrection. Look at the next phrase. Risen from the dead. Called to remember the power of the resurrection. 
we lived in Chicago for 10 years, and many homes in Chicago have basements. I don't think you have many basements in Fort Worth because of the, the water table level, but in Chicago you do, but every basement has a sump pump. It's a, a pump in the corner of the basement where groundwater comes in under the foundation, and then it's pumped out. Well, a friend of mine called me in the midst of a rainstorm and said, Tim, our, our basement has water in it. My sump pump's not working. What do I do? Let's just say that he was mechanically challenged. And I said, well, sometimes the motor gets stuck. Just take a hammer and kind of tap on it. Sometimes that'll get the motor going. Well, I hear him clobbering the thing in the background. He said, it's still not working. Can you please come over? So I, I drive through this pouring rainstorm, get to his house, walk in his basement. I instantly saw what the problem was. The sump pump was unplugged. The week before, he had unplugged it to use that outlet for something else in the basement and had forgotten to plug it back in. Now, see, here's the key. The power was there all along, but it wasn't plugged in. Hear these words from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, where Paul describes the power of the resurrection. He says, And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ. Listen, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. You realize what that text is saying to us today? The very same power that God used 2,000 years ago to raise Jesus from the dead is available to you and available to me today. That's awesome. But we've got to be connected to that power. We've got to be plugged in to that power. Well, we don't simply depend on the power of a memory. We depend on the power of a person. In the words of the hymn, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. In just the time I need him. He's always near. He lives. He lives. We're called to remember the power of the resurrection. Third, we're called to remember the promises of God. Look at the next phrase, descended from David. I mentioned a little bit ago that describes Christ's humanity, but, but it also reminds us that Christ was the promised Messiah, the, the one that God foretold that he was sending. It reminds us that we have a God who keeps his promises. When God makes a promise, he keeps it. We make all kinds of promises in our lives, don't we? With every good intention of keeping that promise. We're not making that promise in bad faith. We intend to keep that promise, but because of circumstances, sometimes we're not able to keep our promises. But God always keeps his promises. When God makes a promise, you can take it to the bank. He keeps it. He keeps his word. Over and over again in the scriptures, you, you find a phrase. These things happen that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Do you realize that over 300 prophecies made about the Messiah were specifically fulfilled in the person of Christ? But many of these prophecies were made hundreds of years before Christ was born. And yet they were beautifully and wonderfully fulfilled in Christ. Pro prophecies like... He would be born of a virgin. He would be a descendant of David. He would be named before he was born. He would be born in Bethlehem. He would be betrayed by friends. He would be forsaken by his disciples. Soldiers would gamble for his garments. Every single prophecy made about the Messiah was fulfilled in the person of Christ. It reminds us that our God is a God who keeps his promises. He keeps his word. And you know, one of the greatest promises that God gives us in his word is found in John chapter 5, verse 24. John 5, 24 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has passed from death to life. That is a promise. God says, if, if you are in Christ, if you have put your faith and trust in Christ, you have passed from death to life. So the question for each one of us this morning is, have we put our faith and trust in Christ? Or are we still trusting in ourselves, in our own good works, in our own religious ritual? 
In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Well, we sometimes get things backwards. We, we realize that we have failed and sinned against God, that we haven't lived up to his standards. And so, so we say, you know what? I'm going to get my act together. I'm going to clean myself up. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do all this good, and then when I'm ready, then I'm going to come to God. But, but we have it exactly backwards because you know the problem with that approach? Even as we're trying to clean ourselves up, we're just making more messes. That's why Scripture says, come to Him as we are. And here's the wonderful assurance of Scripture. John 6, 37, Jesus says, All the Father gives to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will not turn away. You have the promise from the lips of Jesus Himself that if you will come to Him in repentant faith, He will receive you, He will welcome you, He will forgive you. If you're here today and have never put your faith and trust in Christ, call on him today. He keeps his word. We're to remember the promises of God. Fourth, we're to remember the priority of the gospel. The text continues. Paul writes, According to my gospel, for which I suffer to the point of being bound like a criminal. The gospel is the most important message in the world. It's the greatest news anyone could ever hear. And Paul said, in light of that, I, I'm willing to suffer anything. I'm, I'm willing to endure any circumstances as long as I'm able to communicate the good news to others. Paul remembered the priority of the gospel. The question is, do we? Do we look around at our world and see people who are lost? See people who are in need. I saw a bumper sticker years ago that read, Apathy is rampant in America, but who cares? <laughs> you know, tragically, apathy can be rampant in churches as well. Who cares? Well, well God cares, and we need to care as well. In John chapter 4, Jesus said to his disciples, do, do you say yet four months and then come the harvest? I tell you, lift up your eyes. See that the fields are white unto harvest. Why did Jesus need to instruct them and through them instruct us to lift up our eyes? Well, because left to ourselves, where are our eyes? They're on ourself. We're self-centered. We're selfish. We're worried about our own world, our own struggles, our own needs, and we're not seeing the harvest fields of the world. God calls us to lift up our eyes, to remember the priority of the gospel. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus tells us a parable, a parable of the sower. He talks about this sower went out and sowed seed, and the seed fell on four different kinds of soil. Some was hard soil, some was rocky, some was thorny, and some was good soil. I think many times we misapply that parable. It does not say the sower went out to inspect the soil. And where he thought he found good soil, he sowed the seed. But where he suspected it might be bad soil, he withheld the seed. And yet I think oftentimes that's what we do. Scripture says man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. Here's another way to phrase it. Never say no for someone else. You know, I've done that far too often in my life. I've had an opportunity to talk to somebody about Christ, and I've assumed they wouldn't be interested, and so I have said no for them. Before God, I have asked God, God, help me to not do that again. Help me to stop saying no for other people. If they say no to Christ, that's one thing, but I want to stop saying no for them. I want to stop assuming they're bad soil. I don't know. My job, your job, is not to be a soil inspector, but to be a sower. And as we sow, we have the assurance that some of that seed will fall on good soil. We're to remember the priority of the gospel. Finally, we're to remember the paradox of suffering. Paul notes, for which I suffer to the point of being bound like a criminal. Here you have Paul, he's serving Christ. He's wanting to honor God with his life. And what happens? He, he gets arrested and thrown in prison. Think if you were in that situation. I, I think if I were in that situation, I'd probably be complaining a little bit, griping a little bit. God, what's up with this? I'm trying to honor you, serve you. 
Paul did not view his imprisonment as punishment for preaching the gospel, but as a platform for preaching it in a new place. The gospel has now entered that prison. Paul was chained to a guard. Never had a captive audience like that before. <laughs> and all day long, Paul had the opportunity to share Christ. He, he writes that even though he was in prison, the word of God was not bound. Roman authorities couldn't construct a prison that could contain the word of God. There's a poem about the Bible called, Yet It Lives. L listen to these words of encouragement. Generation follows upon generation, yet it lives. Nations rise and fall, yet it lives. Kings, dictators, and, and yes, presidents come and go, yet it lives. Doubted, suspected, criticized, yet it lives. Scoffed at by scorners, yet it lives. Ranted and raved about, yet it lives. It's very inspiration denied, yet it lives. It lives as a lamp to our feet, as a light to our path, as food to the hungry, as water to the thirsty, as salvation for the sinner, as grace for the Christian. It lives. Paul said, even though I'm in chains, the word of God is not in chains. The gospel cannot be chained. It's still going for. You see, Paul's perspective allowed him to continue to minister even in the midst of challenging circumstances. Paul was in chains, but the word of God was not in prison. And that's a reminder to us. We see it throughout Scripture. We know it from our own experience that many times... It's in the most challenging circumstances of our life that God does the most in us and through us. I think about the discovery of penicillin. Alexander Fleming, a British researcher, was just getting ready to examine a culture under a microscope. He was in a dusty old laboratory with a window open, and a mold spore blew in and landed on that microscope plate just before he examined it, and he saw it, and it led to the discovery of penicillin. Decades later, he was led on a tour of a brand-new research facility, research laboratory, climate-controlled, temperature-controlled, stainless steel everywhere. And the tour guide leader said, Dr. Fleming, just think of what you could have discovered had, had you had a laboratory like this. And... Alexander Fleming said, well, not penicillin. <laughs> Oftentimes, it's in our most challenging circumstances that God does the most in us and through us. So what about you today? Are you currently in the midst of circumstances that you didn't choose, that are hard, that are difficult, that are painful? In confidence, the believer can testify by faith truth of Romans 8 28 that we know that in all things not just in some things not even just in most things but in all things God works for our good and for his glory many times though we can't see that at the moment we see it later on I was uh an athlete in high school, I can say that because I went to a high school with 95 students. If you could walk and chew gum, you were an athlete in my school. Basketball was really my sport, but because I could walk and chew gum, I also played football. I was actually a wide receiver. And during the state playoffs, I went up to catch a ball, and I got hit from one side by the middle linebacker, the other side from the strong safety, and they bent my knee 45 degrees the wrong way, tore three of the four ligaments in my knee. Now, that was devastating for me because I had signed to play college basketball at a small school in Kansas. While I was in the hospital recovering from surgery, the coach called me. He said, Tim, we've decided to go a different direction with that scholarship. It was devastating for me. I, I couldn't see God in the midst of this, but that caused me to change schools. And it was because I went to Kansas State University that I genuinely met Christ. I was a disciple. And if I could find that middle linebacker and strong safety today, I would hug them. <laughs> 
They were God's instruments. Could I see good at the time? No, not a shred. But I look back now and say, God, what a wonderful plan. By faith. Stephen Olford, the great Welsh preacher, once said, everyone admires a person of faith, but no one wants to live like one. But God calls us to live as men and women of faith. All of us are going to go through tough times in life. In fact, one of the promises that Jesus gives us is found in John 16, 33. You know that promise? Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulation. How many of you got up this morning and said, Lord, I'd like to claim that promise? I want to stand on that promise that I'm going to have hardship in this world. Well, none of us did that, but you know what's a promise nevertheless? We're in a Genesis 3 world, a world that is broken because of sin. But Jesus goes on in John 16, 33, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. That perspective allows us to endure challenging times. Every time I fly into Dallas, I'm reminded of years ago, over 35 years ago now, one of my friends had their first child at a hospital in Dallas. It was a girl. And he did what dads did. He, he stood outside the nursery, you know, where you put your face up to the glass and look in, and he just gazed at his newborn daughter all, all evening. In fact, he stayed so late that a cleaning lady was coming down mopping the hallway. And she saw him staring in and said, is that your daughter? And he said, yes. She said, she's beautiful. He said, well, thank you, she is. And then this cleaning lady said, but you know, the way this world is, it, it almost seems like a shame to bring a child into this world. And my friend said he was glad at that moment that he remembered the second stanza in the song, Because He Lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy she brings. But greater still, the calm assurance that that child can face uncertain days because he lives. He lives. Well, how's your memory this morning? Do you remember? God's given us something far greater than a Kodak camera to help us remember. He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit. It helps those of us who easily forget to remember. Remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. Remember Jesus.